Let me introduce uh, Seneca in general, because he's not just a literary figure, he's an important figure in history, in Roman uh, history. But he's a bit enigmatic, and we can construct a lot of different images and pictures of what Seneca is, which is why I'm putting this imaginary bust that was created in the 17th century of him here, because we're going to create an imaginary image of him here in the 21st century on the basis of the materials we have, his own writings and what other people have said about him. Now, here's a set of facts about him that we can take as certain, and after relating them to you, I'll show how ambivalent of a situation they still lead us in. So, it's interesting that he's born the same year as Jesus. Uh, interesting because that allows us to really think about what this period of history is. Um, I, think, I think his writings are a lot more interesting than Jesus' writings. That's just because Jesus didn't write anything. So, of course they are. <laughs> Insofar as they're interesting, they're interesting. Um, uh, that's one thing we can say about Seneca, is he was born in the year 4 AD. In the year 41 AD, he was banished from Rome because he was charged with engaging in adultery. He spent his time in exile on the island of Corsica, writing some consolations that we'll read, and also writing about natural philosophy, a work that we won't uh, be reading too much of, although we will read a small part of. Um, in 49, he was called back from Seneca in order to, to tutor this young, upstart, very promising uh, individual named Nero. Um, but uh, in 54, he officially becomes his uh, tutor, and he has several tutors, receives an excellent education. And in this year, Seneca also publishes a satire and was probably working on some of his other dramatic works and also wrote a work on Mercy or De Clementia, which is directly addressed to Cicero. And that specific work we will also uh, read and discuss. Um, Nero, however, as you may have heard, turned out pretty bad. He did things like murdering his brother and his own mother, and it appears that Seneca wrote a letter on his behalf explaining or even justifying these actions to the Senate. Uh, but Nero didn't really replay, repay his kindness for this. In the year 62, Seneca asked for permission to retire from public affairs and reply, retire from this advisory role that he'd had for Seneca from so, for so long. And Nero said, no, you can't do that. You can't actually retire. That will be perceived as there being some problem. So you're not allowed to do that. Um, Seneca started writing a series of letters, of moral letters at this point, that survive in their entirety, and I asked you to read the first letter in my own translation, part of the supplementary readings for the class, but there's 123 other letters that he wrote that are all collected together and all uh, survive. And I could go into some more details about Nero's life, and I will when we read on Mercy, the work of Seneca directly uh, addressed to him. Uh, but he did things like, um, well, the legend is that he played a violin while Rome uh, burned. He may, there's questions as to whether he may have started the fire. Uh, or whether it was merely a convenient fire that took care of a lot of real estate problems and allowed him to build this gigantic, the largest ever uh, palace and a colossal structure to himself and a fitting theater for his own performances because Nero considered himself an artist, although most other people didn't, although they didn't exactly say that to him. Um, <clears throat> Seneca uh, was... Um, 
perceived to be part of a conspiracy to assassinate Nero, and as a result of that was forced to commit suicide in the year 65. And we have various accounts of his suicide. It was a public ritualized suicide that was also sort of bungled because it turns out you can't use Plato's description of Socrates' suicide as a handbook for how to commit suicide. If you're going to kill yourself, please don't use the Phaedo as a handbook for how to do it. It doesn't actually work that way, and it'll cause complications, and you'll need to do other, um, take, take other measures, and it might not be as pretty as Plato uh, describes it. Um, those are all facts about his life, but they really don't explain to us what the nature uh, and character of this man was. In fact, they, it, it, it raises a lot of questions. Uh, now, there are some very good, even recent, biographies about him. Um, one of the most impressive is this one by James Rom called Dying Every Day, which focuses on Seneca in the court of Nero. Dying Every Day is an expression that Seneca has. He thinks that we shouldn't talk about how we're living every day, we should talk about how we're dying every day, because that's what's actually happening. And we ought to focus not on just coming up with a philosophy for how to live, but a philosophy of how to die. And he takes this claim of Socrates that philosophy is practicing dying very seriously, and that what philosophy does is teaches you how to deal with your mortality and figure out how to die uh, correctly. Something that, that it's such a touchy subject, nobody ever wants to talk about it. When we hear that people are dying, we say, oh, don't worry, it'll be fine and you'll live forever. Uh, but it's not actually true. Uh, and so what we ought to do is actually be a lot more serious about that, confront it directly and start practicing dying right away. Now, Laura, you raised your hand. Oh, yeah. So who said memento mori? Was that Socrates or Seneca? Well, that's a Latin... Uh, translation of, of a Greek sentiment that we find in, um, in uh, Socrates. Of course, Socrates didn't actually write anything, so we find it in Plato, but this idea of meditate on death, concentrate on death, think about death. Don't avoid thinking about death, which is what everybody actually does, but instead think about it all the time. And, and, and don't just think of yourself as being, as living, think of yourself as dying. Dying is not something that, that happens all at once, it's something that starts happening the day you're born. Uh, and so we need to sort of shift our focus, and when we realize that, it can actually lead to a life-affirming uh, realizations about what to do with the time that we have remaining and what's really important. If you People that are told, hey, you've got six months to live, suddenly their priorities in life change a lot. Okay, But we're all in that condition of having a finite life. And so we ought to, we ought to, so if I tell you you've only got 80 years to live, it ought to have a very similar effect because it's such a vanishingly small point of time uh, you know, relative to cosmic history and so forth. So that is a Latinate translation of an expression of uh, a, a Greek expression of Socrates and a whole kind of way of looking at the point of philosophy. I read that Seneca's like, like final death and like slit his wrist and then like get the poison and like none of that worked and so they like steam that? Like... Yeah, so he, um, again it was kind of a bungled thing, it didn't, it didn't work out. The, you know, drinking hemlock is apparently, can make you violently sick, it doesn't necessarily do the job in, so then you slit your wrist, but that can take a long time and doesn't always go that well. And then there's the whole issue of, is my wife committing suicide at the same time or not? And did he pressure her into doing it? Or did she voluntarily couldn't live without him and so had to do it? Uh, and how, how exactly that all went down uh, is difficult to say, especially since our sources that describe it are hostile to him. So one of them is in favor of him, another is very hostile to him. So let me just read, this is the very first page of the introduction to James Rom's uh, account of Seneca at the court of Nero, and I think it perfectly encapsulates 
the two different images we have of Seneca, which are completely mutually exclusive, but evidence can be used to support either of them. Okay, so introduction, the two Senecas. Here is one way to describe the career of Seneca, writer, thinker, poet, moralist, and for many years, top advisor and close companion of the emperor Nero. By a strange twist of fate, a man who cherished sobriety, reason, and moral virtue found himself at the center of Roman politics. He did his best to temper the whims of a deluded despot while continuing to publish the ethical treatises that were his true calling. When he could no longer exert influence in the palace, he withdrew and in solitude produced his most stirring meditations on virtue, nature, and death. Enraged by his departure, the emperor he had once advised seized on a pretext to force him to kill himself. His adoring wife tried to join in his sober, courageous suicide, but imperial troops intervened to save her. And then here's another way to describe the very same life. A clever manipulator of undistinguished origin connived his way into the center of Roman power. He used verbal brilliance to represent himself as a sage. He exploited his vast influence to enrich himself and touched off a rebellion in Britain by lending usurously to its inhabitants. After conspiring in or even instigating the palace's darkest crimes, he tried to rescue his reputation with carefully crafted literary self-fashionings. When it was clear that the emperor's enmity posed a threat, he sought refuge at the altar of philosophy, even while leading an assassination plot. His final bid for esteem was his histrionic suicide, in which he browbeat his unwilling wife into sharing it. Okay, so, but which of those is the true Seneca? Or rather, what is the realistic, actual picture we can paint of him? Well, in this class, we're focused on his actual philosophical writings and how far they relate to earlier philosophical views and how far they're true in and of themselves. We're not going to be looking at these historical sources that tell us how he actually lived. And so even if it were possible to construct a more realistic picture of him, one that would decide between these, these two views that Rom describes, we won't be able to do it here, because we'll be focused on his philosophical work. And so, here's what I want to say about his philosophical work. First of all, his advice, his playing an advisory role, essentially the domestic minister of uh, Nero, should be understood in the context of the long history before him, and also the long subsequent history of philosophers getting involved in politics, and philosophers advising kings, and really advising princes. And we call this literature the mirror of princes literature, where philosophers hold up a mirror, supposedly, to princes and let them see them their true selves and revise what they do accordingly. And this goes all the way back to 4th century, even 5th century BC, with Isocrates writing letters to Philip, to Alexander, and so forth, telling him, and, and uh, Cypriot kings, and so forth, advising them how they should uh, use philosophical insight in order to govern better. There's also the episode of Plato and uh, Dionysus, a uh, prince from Sicily in Syracuse, uh, I don't have time to go into the details of that story, but to make a long story short, didn't go very well, didn't end very well. Then there's Aristotle's advising a tyrant named Hermias, and then his taking over the tutoring of Alexander, when he was Alexander the Small, before he was Alexander the Great. Uh, and then there's this example of Seneca and Nero. And then there are many, many subsequent examples that we could discuss um, taking us well into the 20th century, uh, 21st century, actually. Uh, and, you know, the outcome of this is that basically it doesn't go well. You'd think that philosophers advising 
politicians would be a good idea. But sometimes the advice is misguided and, so it, and is taken and it doesn't go well. And sometimes the advice is taken and doesn't go well. But the general um, outcome is that it doesn't seem to go very well. And that in, a, in and of itself is both a polit political and a philosophical problem. I mean, it stems back to this argument that Plato makes that there will be no end of ills for mankind unless either kings become philosophers or philosophers are made into kings. And the problem is that this is never accomplished. The kings don't spend enough time studying philosophy, so they don't become philosophers. And certainly philosophers are never elevated to the status of being kings. Exceptions to that include Marcus Aurelius, who was a practicing Stoic and emperor, and then the later emperor uh, Julian, who turned back the association of Rome with Christianity and wanted it to be very much more inspired by classical philosophy, especially the philosophy of Plato, Aristotle, uh, and so on. Um, now, as I said, we can't concentrate on or even figure out something as clear as what happened with Seneca's death. So, in a philosophical mode, we have to concentrate on his works, and he has a rather large corpus of works that include not just philosophical works, but include several other kind of works. He wrote a bunch of actual uh, tragedies. All of these, or nine, nine of these, survive. He also wrote several philosophical works, which we problematically call dialogues or essays. I'll explain why that's problematic. Not all of his philosophical works survive, but a substantial number of them do. He also wrote three works of consolation designed to take somebody who's suffering from some form of emotional distress and use uh, a kind of, as it were, cognitive behavioral therapy to relieve that distress and relieve that emotional uh, pain. He also wrote as I mentioned earlier, 124 moral letters addressed to edify a particular person named uh, Lucilius. He wrote seven books on physics. Those are the natural questions. He wrote a satire that most people think he actually was the author of, although some people doubt that Seneca was the author of it, so we call it a dubious work. Finally, there are spurious works that somebody created and fabricated a bunch of letters that Seneca is supposed to have exchanged with the Apostle Paul, because Seneca's brand of Stoicism was considered congenial to Christianity, and in fact, when Christianity, which had no philosophical basis, was looking for some philosophical basis for its ethics, the first stage that it did was try to take over Stoic ethics, and incorporated Stoic ethics, and if you want to know something about Christian ethics, you need to study Stoic ethics. But somebody took this a step further and said, no, he actually was a Christian, and he actually engaged in uh, exchanges of letters with early leaders of the Christian church, and they fabricated letters to this uh, effect. And though they're spurious, it's interesting to think about Seneca's legacy in connection with him. Uh, so these are the dubious and spurious works. I've already uh, said enough about those. A satirical work, a uh, tragedy, and these letters with Paul. Here's the Greek tragedies, which we do attribute them to him. So this is a really important aspect of Seneca that we'll say almost nothing about, that he's an extremely important ancient tragedian. People talk about his influence on later tragedies, and later dramatic works, such as those of uh, Shakespeare. Also, there have been two books written about how his tragic works relate to his philosophical works. Both of those students in earlier versions of this class wrote reports up on, which you can read in the collection of reports if you're interested in that aspect of his thought further. Here are the so-called essays 
or dialogues. We don't know how to classify them exactly. Yeah, Laura? Um, so Stoics kind of have this reputation of being kind of hardcore and dark. So is it the perception of death that kind of gave them that association and focus on tragedy? Or? Well, partly it is their uncompromising philosophy in saying things like that they're indifferent to death, they're indifferent to pain, they're also indifferent to life and indifferent to pleasure. And so, you know, that looks like a really hard line. Uh, philosophy, and when we read the Greek philosophers, that's the impression we get. They're not even like the, uh, you know, Aristotle or Plato or these academic philosophers who say that virtue is really important and outshines everything else, but of course there is, there is something good about being healthy, about being beautiful, about being fit and things like that, and that that actually is a kind of good. And of course there is something good about having wealth and having a living in a stable country and things like that. Stoics say, no, none of that is relevant at all to virtue. So that was like a really radical, almost un unbelievably radical version of the philosophy. We saw Cicero's criticisms of it like that. Um, the uh, Seneca is actually taken to be not as radical of a Stoic for several reasons. One of them is that he actually combines Epicureanism and think that, thinks that Epicureanism is valid to a certain extent and for certain purposes. And that's something we see in what we read today, in making use of Epicureanism somehow. So that doesn't look like hardcore, hard-carrying uh, Stoicism. Another thing is that Seneca's almost entire emphasis, everything he's addressing is to people who are not sages and who need to make moral progress himself in the first case, but also Lucilus, who he addresses in the various addressees of these philosophical works. These aren't, these, the, he's not addressing Chrysippus and working on Stoic theory. He's addressing real people living hard lives, and he's talking about them making moral progress, something we don't find Greek Stoic philosophers talking a lot about. You know, Greek philosophers say, hey, moral progress is irrelevant. Whether you're um, at the bottom of the ocean or an inch from the surface, you drown. Meaning, if you're, if you're not a perfect sage who has wisdom, then you don't have any of the virtues, and therefore you have all of the vices and you're completely ignorant. Whereas we find Sto Seneca talking a lot more about the stage where you're learning, you're getting better, you're diminishing your vices, but you're not yet a sage. So. Seneca is a hardcore guy in terms of he's telling you things that seem like, you know, all focus on your death every day, focus on how you're dying every day, and so forth. But there's a way of looking at him as sort of watering down Stoicism in a way, watering it down in a very dangerous way, in fact, a way that's open to certain Epicurean views. Uh, okay, but just an overview of these works on anger, which we'll read for next week giving very practical, cognitive, behavioral, therapeutic advice on how to deal with the emotion of anger, on the shortness of life, um, on the firmness of the wise person, on clemency or on mercy addressed to Nero, on the happy life we're discussing today, which is addressed to his brother Gallio, a work on leisure addressed to his friend uh, Cyrenus, a uh, closely related work on tranquility of the mind, also addressed to Serenus. Seven books, very substantial books, on benefits or on doing favors to people. And then a work um, on providence, which is addressed to Lucilus, who is also the addressee of the moral letters. Yeah. So, um, and, and on anger and on tranquility of mind, he seems he starts with, uh, you know, like theories, and then he has uh, practices yeah. for, you know, putting those into your life. Correct. Is that a common theme in most of these, or? Yes, because he wants them to be works of practical philosophy, and of course, practical philosophy only makes sense and succeeds if people actually live better lives. 
Again, we don't want to know a uh, theory of how to live better. We want to live better. We don't want to know a theory about what anger is. We want to find out a way, a means of controlling anger. Okay? We don't want to have a theory about what death is. We want to figure out how we should die and what would make our death uh, a good one. Uh, but his method is very much to, as you say, begin with a theoretical approach, begin with some definitions of it, and then get into more and more closer practical advice about how these theories could actually be implemented in your, in your life. Okay, so there's a theory about what mercy or clemency is, and then there are specific recommendations about how Nero ought to be using it in his own case, and so on. Uh, so it is very much a combination of, of theory and practice, and not mere theory. The consolations say more about when we get to them, but there are three of them, and they are addressed to different people and for different purposes. Interestingly, two of them are addressed to women, so we get more uh, interaction with women and philosophical interaction with women, taking women very seriously. They're every bit as philosophical, apparently, as uh, men. So